Moving Iron Podcast is proud to be part of the Global Ag Network. The network is live, so check out globalagnetwork.com for more details and updates. Now on to the show. Moving Iron in the 21st century. Hardworking people working hard for you and me. Moving Iron time and time again. Hello and welcome to Moving Iron Podcast Markets with Sean Hackett. Sean, how are you doing this morning? Or I guess it's okay, afternoon, super. I guess. Yeah, yeah it's uh, afternoon, evening. Yep. Depends where you're at. Depends <laughs> on where you're at. Yeah, it's anywhere in the world, right? All right. We've had uh, a couple crazy days here, right? So Friday we had this report come out that was lack of a better term abysmal right um the information there was uh very much skewed wasn't necessarily correct um usda came out and said it wasn't correct and basically friday corn and and soybeans for the most part were limit down right now you take a look at what's happened across here when you start looking at crop progress reports and everything else that's out there and, and my neck the woods there is some corn out there right now and and that is uh where it should be for this time of the year but I, I, there's a lot out there that's two or three feet tall. You know, not even three feet tall. Two and a half foot tall, two foot tall, something like that. Um, I, I'm kind of, I'm really new to this whole the, the commodity side of the business and really paying attention to what's going on here, other than just watching the numbers kind of, kind of, kind of come across and what we see there. But this report was a huge disservice to the American farmer, and 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 quite frankly, it, it they should be there should be pit, pitchforks and torches all over the place raising cane about what's going on here right now so sean talk to me about what you think about that report and and what you see happening out there right now look the usda this is not the first time the usda has come out with questionable reports it happens right fairly regularly unfortunately whether it's coral grain stocks i mean there's times they, they pull out a number and you go what in the world did they get that from you know you know when they know it's not right the markets react i mean remember computers are driving the market right computers remember and it's, it puts it into the algorithm and it says sell. Right. And it doesn't, it's not thinking about what we're talking about right here. It's saying that means sell, and they just sell the market off. But it, it, so, someone should be fired over this. I mean, anyone who's anyone knows what t- what's t- taken place, knew that number wasn't right. They knew that the number wasn't right. They should have absolutely said, we have to come out with the report. The survey is what it is, but we know it's totally incorrect and, and they should have come out with something the day before two days before and say look we have to come out with this report don't really pay any attention to it we're going to come out with a resurveyed report you know and whatever it is august 12th so just hang in there but or or they should have just said you know we're just opting to delay the report we're going to delay it because we're not we don't feel we're getting the information we need and instead of sending out information that's not right we're going to stick with our 3 million acres down that we put out a couple of weeks before and, you know, and come out with the right number or something more real in August. And, and I think the market would have been fine with that. I think in they fact, would have I been think too. they would have looked at that and yeah. said, because <clears throat> that means that they're going to bring the numbers down. You know right. what I'm saying? And then was the, the other cloudy part of that report was you didn't know if prevent plant was put into that mix, if it wasn't put, I mean, you, there were so many just so many variables that that wasn't very clear on whether it was in the report or wasn't in the report. And, you know, you start talking about to to folks that are going to go out and start trading this stuff. Like you said, you know, you got algorithms out there running all this stuff. They don't, they don't know. I mean, I get phone calls all the time from guys talking to me about what's happening in used equipment, what's happening in, in the crop market, what's happening on your neck, the woods, and I tell them all that. And it's, it is, it is completely different than what they believe or what they even know and then you put this report out on top of that, and to come out after the report comes out, not just like immediately after, but a day after, it's like, oh, by the way, we're going to come back in August and re- reevaluate this because, you know what, it's not necessarily correct. The market had already traded that stuff, and corn went limit down that day, almost limit down. And it's just this kind of stuff right here is, is, is what drives me nuts about the USDA when you start looking at what's going on out there. I mean, You've got all these different things happening. You've got all this stuff with the, with with crop progress and and the amount of 
prevent plant? Is it 8 million acres? Is it 15 million acres? Is it 30 million acres? There's all these numbers getting tossed around here. And the one department that is that is control of what's going on and under, is supposed to be telling the U.S. farmer what's going on and what's driving the price of, of commodities doesn't know what's going on and is that incompetent. It drives me crazy. It, it's driven me crazy for a long time, and we've talked about this for over a decade, about the the, the kind reporting that the USDA puts out and, and how much of a disservice it, it is and continues to be. Right. Um, in fact, we would argue it's gotten worse over the years, not better. Yep. Um, and, and just a, a, a great example of the real market is one of the things we think that got the market excited, let's say today, is that cash basis in the United States for corn just went through the roof, meaning the cash price yep. spiked relative to the futures. I mean, some of the most dramatic cash, uh, narrowing of cash basis we've seen in a long, long time show that, that it was this move down and corn was completely uh, unjustified. And the buyers, who of course know this, just came in yep. and st- take it all. That's right. So the market looked at the cash price and said, I mean, the futures market looked at the cash price and the court said, whoa, we got this wrong. And then boom, they immediately go right up once that cash got stiff like this. So yep. that's the real market. The real market is telling you, you know, we have a big problem out there. And because cash... You can lie about a lot of things, but the cash never lies. It's a real buyer, a real seller saying, what's the real price for corn need to be? And they're t- they told you in the cash price this week, the futures market was full of it. Yep. That's it. Yep. So I, I keep hearing, I, 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 I'm, this is another thing that I, that really bothers me a lot, that I'm, I'm, I hear a lot of folks bring up, and they talk about it pretty extensively. There's still a lot of folks out there that think that the corn market is going to be that 174, 175, 173, something like that. USD's got USDA's got it pegged at 165, so take that for what it's worth. I'm looking at my immediate area. I'm talking to the guys out in Illinois that I know in Indiana and in and, and those areas, Missouri and those places like that. Their corn is not any different than mine is out here in western Nebraska. I think we're going to have a hard time getting to 150. What's your thought on that? We think if there's any risk to the USDA... By the way, we... I will. I want to give them credit when I think they deserve it. I give them credit for knocking the corn yield down to one sixty-six. Oh, absolutely, definitely. Yeah, they could have easily stuck with that one seventy-three number and ran with it all day long. They just never do that in the June report, and they actually right. did something correct. So I, I want to say that I felt moving that far down on the yield in the June report. I, I want to. I want to. You know, congratulate them for doing. I thought that was the right move, but if there's any risk to that number is to the downside, right. not to the upside. So I think it's a good starting point, and I certainly understand why they don't want to go to 156 immediately. Right. But I do think that uh, their 166 is probably an extremely optimistic number. And, and I mean, we, we could paint, uh, you get a hot August or a hot September at the wrong time or get a, a frost that kicks in before crops matured. You know, we could be looking at something... I could argue we'd be looking at something potentially 20 bushel to the acre below 166 if you had you know, a bad finish to the crop. Um, one of the things that we look at is that uh, if we had really you know, record hot weather the rest of the way, we would still have a large percentage of corn not black later, uh, uh, still not reach black later by October. Yep. And, and, and we're going to have, and by the way, there's a little warm spell that we've had. We're going right back to cool. Right. Yeah. Back, back up July. It's, Right back to cool. So, so by no means are we going to have record hot rest of the way. Right. So, we are not going to be in any position to have this cross mature on time, uh, or, or or finish out at all. And we're going to push this harvest and this development way into the you know into the way into the fall. And um, you know that's just problematic with all kinds of complications that comes from that. So we, we are not even beginning to to, to even really contemplate you know, what this yield could look like given that we're just as you said a couple of feet high three feet high I mean, we're just getting started yet it's right. july 4 right <laughs> yep yeah we have a uh, you know i, I kind of look at what we have going on out here and our historically somewhere around october 15th is is a hard freeze usually by halloween we've had one two maybe even three snows nothing of any equivalents you know what i mean it's just like it snowed you know it kind of dusted the ground those kind of things every once in a while you get some snow with that but the way i look at it is if everything just stays the same everything stays the same 
by first part of August, we're pollinating corn out here. We're four and a half weeks behind. I'm just saying, if nothing changes, everything stays the same. The weather patterns are that they're predicting stay the same way. Well, we're, now we're pollinating corn the first part of September, middle of September, something like that, and we're 30 days away from a frost. It's not done yet, even though it's pollinated. It's not done yet. So that that I mean, we could be looking at a lot of silage getting cut this year, and not necessarily a lot of corn actually being put in the bin. Well, there's a huge difference between silage, absolutely, and, and that's a that's a that's a uh, another um, uh, consequence of this kind of a year that doesn't go into what was actually produced or the yield, but it, but it has to do with how do you use it, right. you know? And so, look, um, we're a long way away from calling the the, the bull market and corn dead, right. uh, but we're going to have some volatility. Absolutely. Um, that's part of the equation, and, yep. and there's lots of things going on. I understand that it's nothing to straight up move, and and I and I would think that that's probably, <laughs> you know, that's the, probably the last time we're going to get a U.S. day report that's going to be that ridiculous. I think going forward, we're going to get things more moving in the right direction. Certainly, August twelfth, which is the resurvey number for corn, you know, we would expect us to get at least closer to the truth. So, so we traded that ridiculous number. We got all those sellers out of the way. We did what we had to do. The basis really took off. And so I think we're now ready to, to move on. Um, and um, whether anything ever comes from what the USDA did or, or not, you know, it's a political thing. And right. they probably all want to, everyone wants to forget about what happened there. But the, but the most important thing is I think what's happened this week is showing that, that, that the corn market is ready for shifting to looking ahead and, and, we're, and we're done trading that report right. moving on. Yep. Yeah. So there, I mean, like today, you know, December corn finished up, I think, 17 and a quarter, and September corn is like 15 and a half or 15 and a quarter, something like that. So I had a huge reversal from what it was through the first couple of days of the week, you know, after that Friday report and watching things go crazy and then a little bit of a bounce back on Monday, but not much, and then Tuesday, whatever, and then all of a sudden tooks off like crazy on, on, on you know, today on Wednesday. I, you know, again, it's disappointing that we had that come out, and you don't want to keep dwelling on that. But long story short, there is some opportunities out there. If you know, if you get some corn made, that you're going to be able to make some money by the end of the year. We've talked about that since January. That that four fifty to five dollar corn range is going to be there for marketing, not necessarily um, you know basis aside. You know, you're looking at some some decent numbers out there. So I think there's going to be some great opportunities for for our uh, for producers out there to make some money this year. Uh, absolutely, um, and and if we and I, I've always talked. We've talked about the 1993 market, it's really the only market we have that's even remotely even in the ballpark of this kind of a year. We had a, a big move in the end of June. We had a setback in July, but then the rally from August on was actually the big move, the bigger move, the move that went actually to new highs. And so, if we, I think December corn, try to remember exactly 485, 487, I'm, somewhere up there is where it, it, it reached its peak. You know, there would be no reason to think that once we got uh, to the other side, and we started really contemplating, you know, what being, you know, I mean, we could be looking at two to three billion bushel corn short, uh, shortfalls from, you know, ending stocks minus two billion, minus three billion without rationing demand. You know, I'm not sure what that looks like, but it's not sub four, a uh, sub five. You know, I mean, right. it's something much higher than that. And, you know, the market would have to decide how far to go and everything else. But, um, and we still feel that the best opportunities are still ahead for the corn market. And certainly, even though farmers are going to have crops that are smaller and maybe not uh, as good as they would like, to the extent they still have old crop to sell, to the extent that they have a crop to come, um, there is going to be some opportunities to have a better outlook than the outlook they were looking at just a month and a half, two months ago with 330, 340 corn. And, you know, looking like we're going to, you know, there's no hope, no future uh, at all. So okay. I'll... I'll I'll take this versus that any day. Yeah. So. Well, the positive side, I just got my uh, my evening alert here, and corn has opened up seventeen seventy five in September, and and uh, right around fifteen. What is that? Fifteen, fifteen and a quarter. So it's pretty much it opened back up where it closed. So that's uh, that's a good, that's a positive sign. So. Things are going to keep moving in a general direction. So, all right, let's bounce over to some other stuff here. Let's take a look at the cattle complex, what we have going on over there. Cattle market right now has been kind of getting beat up here the last couple of weeks. You've seen some things happen. Obviously, you're going to see that happen with the price of corn kind of going up and down. You, there's a there's a correlation there. Um, right. 
But on the flip side of that, you know, the hog market is another one of those things where you're starting to see some glimmer of hope there with, with what's going on, but also it's still kind of getting kicked around as well. So the protein markets aren't necessarily uh, on fire like everything else is, but there is some optimism there. The standard rule has always been when feed prices go up a lot, the livestock sector comes under pressure because of the threat, herd liquidation, right? Um, all that sort of thing. However, uh, we think that this the back half of the year, we could break that correlation. That even if corn takes off into the fives and, we, and soybeans take, you know, we, we get a big, we get another big move in grain and feed prices. We think we could uh, disconnect from that relationship, and because of, we think because the demand from African swine fever, which has been put off for a whole bunch of reasons due to trade wars, some excess of culling that Chinese did that had excess supplies hit their market, and they had to eat through that. Um, but, but we think that demand for meat protein, whether it's chicken, beef, or pork, is going to be so extreme and, and, and perpetual and pervasive as we move into the fourth quarter that we think that, that we're going to drive these markets higher, despite the fact that we think feed prices could go up quite a bit. So we could get a very rare situation where feed prices go up like crazy, but so does the cattle, so does the beef, um, and so does the pork and the chicken price. I um, mean, we think that could actually catch a lot of these spread traders off guard because you have a lot of these guys oh, you, you, you go long corn you go short feeders you know and 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 we think that we, we may actually be in a situation where we have a very unusual situation where that doesn't happen um and so we're very optimistic that this asf demand for u.s uh meat protein is going to kick in um and we think both markets are may, either have made the lows or are making the lows and we're, we're going to stay Ready, we're going to get ready to start trading a demand-driven market here in U.S. markets. It's just irrespective of whether the, whether the China trade deal goes well or, or not. We have no idea. They keep talking. The, the, by the, our view is the Chinese have to buy the U.S. meat protein no matter what. They will do it no matter what. And if we sell it to the government directly, they don't pay the tariffs on that anyway. So that's what they're going to do. Yeah. Um, <coughs> despite the feed component that on a day-to-day basis can depress the livestock market. We believe ASF is ready to rock, um, and we think that's going to be the overriding factor in the meat protein market is to drive the market higher. And, of course, the higher the livestock sector goes, the more it can absorb higher feed prices because it's getting a better deal for what they sell. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's – yeah, I I agree with you there. There, There's a lot of – I mean, China's doing whatever they can not to buy anything from the U.S. right now. When you start looking at what their air imports are doing right now, I mean, they just got a big load of shipment, a uh, big load of uh, hogs and stuff out of Canada. They did the same thing with some beef out of uh, out of Brazil, and I mean, sooner or later, those those uh, those those supply lines are gonna are gonna dry up, and that's that's the one thing about the commodity market when it comes to working with China, whatever it is. China might go out and buy all this different stuff from everybody else, but the U.S. and they're going to the USD is going to USDA is going to report. Hey, you know what? China is we're down forty six percent from what what we normally should be buying from China, and da da da. But wherever South Africa or whatever, you know, there's some other country someplace that's going to pick up that slack because China bought that volume, right? So we're gonna we're gonna push stuff someplace. It may not go directly to China. We may very well see stuff go from what you know. U.S. to some other port to China, and then China is not reporting that they bought it from us, but indirectly they did. You know, so I mean, there's there's a million different things going on right there right now, and, and it's a it's a big deal that um, I think if you don't understand the markets and you don't understand what's going on, what you see and what gets reported in the news completely puts you in a different direction where you need to be going. Well, I think I think you're absolutely right, and it, it <clears throat> delay inevitable for as far as we can you know the chinese liquidated you know uh like crazy uh their herd and and, and we had all the supply and they bought from other countries and, and they, you know as you said did everything to push it out push it out and push it out but from the research we have done most of the overhang of supply domestically that they have from the from front end loading all this uh, sl- uh culling and slaughtering that they did is behind them and we feel they've bought as much as they can from the rest of the world to offset that. And now, remember, their high demand part of the meat protein season is the back half of the year, especially the fourth quarter and the first quarter, went into and through their holiday season, 
which is the winter time for us. Right. And so we feel that it's going to be big time uh, demand for U.S. Uh, livestock. And, um, and, and once again, despite the fact that we're bullish on the grains, which would normally depress livestock, we think this is an exception to the rule. It will catch a lot of people off guard and actually could actually create a whipsaw to the hop side because a lot of people are going to get short livestock thinking the normal correlations in place and it's not and they get run over and, it, and then they all have to buy into this massive demand driven market that you know isn't really going to go away just in one quarter or two it, we could be looking at this for at least you know three or four quarters or longer before you know things kind of work themselves out a little bit as they always do you yeah. know yeah okay so one other thing i want to talk to you about here before we shut it down is, is the cotton market we've talked about that a few times on here just because of how how uh you know these different recessions that we've talked about popping up here these near misses that we keep seeing popping up and and obviously the the world is is slowing down if you look at manufacturing across the whole world there there is a slowdown it doesn't really matter and it's it's you can argue it's trade related or whatever else but i think it's just one of those things we're in one of those blips where recession is is, is kind of one of those things that happen so when you look at the cotton market happening right now and and what we saw happening early in the year to where we see happening things now, the the extreme southeast, like we talked about before, it's it's incredibly dry, right? You go across the, the deep south, you know, Alabama, Mississippi, Arkansas, and those, and those key um, areas like that, um, they've gotten a ton of rain, you know, but you move into Texas and depending on where you're at in Texas, east Texas, not so bad. But the stripper cotton parts of Oklahoma and, and Texas, they've had a lot of rain, had to do a lot of replant and those kind of things, and some guys have lost their cotton crop altogether. So with what you see and happen right now in cotton, do you, do you feel like there might be some short-term bullish market there, or do you feel like that is kind of one of those things that it is what it is and that, that cake's been cooked? I prefer to have a better economy in, in terms of the cotton market being really bullish. I mean, you'd rather have strong economy, strong demand, and that would be ideal. In this case, we're not getting that right now. We're having a slowing economy. All the Fed, you know, all the central banks are getting ready to print more money, but there's a lag, and so we're not. We can't expect uh, an overnight sensation to turn the global economy around, and so that's a negative. But we feel what we're seeing in the U.S. production-wise, but more importantly, what we're seeing with India and the and the monsoon really, really continuing to come up short. Just as an example, Indian uh, moisture as a percent of normal in the month of June was down 35% on a na- nationwide basis. I mean, that's one of the worst Junes we've seen in a very, very long time. We look out in July. July is the most important month for Indian monsoon. That's where the highest rainfall occurs and where the most important development for the crops, especially cotton, occurs. If you miss July, you cannot recover in August and September. It, it cannot be done. It is the key month. And when we look out ahead about what's to take place, especially where they grow cotton, we don't see any hope that the rainfall in the cotton areas of India are going to be anything but way, way below normal at the absolute you know, peak monsoon part of the season, which means their production is going to be way, way off, and they are a, you know, a top exporter to China. So without them having a big crop, without them having an ability to export to China and the rest of the world, there's only one other country that can fill that lost supply gap only one and that's the united states um, so so because of that we do think that there's an opportunity for a weather related rally in cotton or let's say between now and in august time frame we don't think it's you know it's a it's a multi-year bull market or a, we think it's a couple of months but it, it could be a really solid weather related spike trade that the farmers and producers could sell into and sell a price that works for them we're really pretty confident we think there's a limit because of the economy right now. Yeah. Yeah, that economy thing is just <clears throat> I, I'm not a conspiracy theorist here, but when I look back and I start looking at what what how the USDA reported that thing, I mean the USD is USDA is is really saddled with making sure the price of, of food stays low, right? And that's and that's kind of the, the whole kind of moniker of of, of, of U.S. agriculture, right? We grow all this food. We can do all these things. We can keep our, our, our prices cool. Well, you start having a big spike in the price of food, that does a lot to drive more towards a recession than, than, it, than it doesn't, right? So I, I don't know. It's kind of one of those off-subject things, but kind of reading into that a little bit, I, I feel like there was something something there that just kind of drives 
drive the, driving that idea? If you look at most uh, <clears throat> global recessions, and you looked at what preceded those global recessions, it almost always had a large spike in overall commodities, including food prices. Right. Just before. So you look at what happened in 2007 into the first half of 2000. We had that massive spike in commodities you know, mm-hmm. and food prices. And then the market, you know, we hit that massive air pocket. Um, you, you look at the massive spike in commodity prices and food prices in the early 1970s. You know, when corn mm-hmm. prices in 1971, 72 went up four or fivefold. And then we had the, the, the stock market of 1974 lose over 55% of its value. We went into a global recession. We can go back and back and back, but there's a consistent behavioral pattern of commodities and food spiking rapidly before we move into one of these big recessions. So it, it almost is fitting, right? right? That as we're slowing down, that this is going to be what pushes the global economy over the edge and into right. and, 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 next cycle so um it's good for farmers <laughs> we get this <laughs> right, right but, yeah but, but it actually would know, be bad in the, in the intermediate term and we just have to make sure you know as bullish as i am and i think you are right now but what we see we also have to know there is a time to sell not, yeah. not necessarily today or tomorrow but there is a time to sell because the economic slow will come back to buy commodities a little later on, just not right now. Yep, absolutely. All right, Sean, good stuff as usual, man. It's, a, it's This is a great conversation. I'm glad we did it tonight. Um, if folks want to reach out to you, get some ideas, or, or maybe pick your brain about stuff, how's the best way to do that? At our website at Hackett, H-A-C-K-E-T-T, advisors.com is the best thing to do. They can go on the white papers and webinars and interviews and see what we do. To see if our kind of work and analysis um, might be of, of value to them. Right on. Well, Sean, enjoy Vancouver, and we will talk to you again next week, bud. Thanks, Mr. Casey. Have a wonderful day. You too. Bye. Thanks for listening to this edition of the Moving Iron Podcast, now part of the Global Ag Network. If you'd like to continue any of these conversations, you can hit me up on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram at Moving Iron LLC. You can also send me an email at Moving Iron Podcast at Moving Iron Podcast.com. You can also visit the Moving Iron Podcast YouTube channel and watch Market Roundup with Chip Nellinger, Sean Hackett, and Angie Setzer. Also, Tax Moves with Glenn Birnbaum. Please visit movingironllc.com. Here you can find information, details, and updates for the 2019 Moving Iron Summit in Nashville, Tennessee. If you'd like to support the podcast, you can leave a review and subscribe at iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher Radio, TuneIn Radio, SoundCloud, and globalagnetwork.com. So until next time, let's go move some iron. This is Casey Seymour. Out. Moving iron in the 21st century. Hardworking people working hard for you and me. Moving iron time and time again. Through the years you'll find us here.